Hey guys, welcome to your pre-match vibes before the Arsenal Bayern game. Make sure you guys like this video, subscribe to the channel. Just gonna let people know that we are live before we get into it. Um, yeah, and make sure you guys are copy and pasting that link for the watch along into your browser and using code Jessica to join in just about 50 minutes or so, we will head on over to TIFO football um, so that we can do the watch along. And um, yeah, so make sure you guys are getting that done as well. Just making sure I'm doing the right thing. All right. And we can go ahead and react to the lineup. Massive game today for Arsenal. Um, the last couple of days have been fucking terrible from like a narrative perspective. And just after the Villa game, I've seen some of the wildest things that it's just we're always one loss. Like we're always one loss away from meltdown. And so personally, like I'm just like just win you guys so that at least the next couple of days can just be like calm because like. Nah, you know, it's just been fucking insane. But um, the lineup is what everybody wants. So if we do not go through, there are certain players that you will not be able to blame for this. And that's just the truth. You know, that's just the reality. So uh, Raya, White, Gabrielle, Saliba, Tomiyasu, Odegaard, Jorginho, and Rice, Saka, Havertz, and Martinelli. So Havertz is not playing midfield. Zinchenko is not in. So this should be the lineup that's perfect and is going to get it over the line. There should be nothing to complain about or anything, right? Because this is the lineup. This is the perfect lineup. So, yeah. Um, so you guys can let me know what you guys think about that. I'm just kind of wanting the game to kind of just go. Like, I just need whatever's going to happen to happen. Um, I'm, I don't know. It's just... I just, I don't even know how to feel. I'm not really even nervous. I'm more just like, just what, like if I could fast forward to just, and just see what the result is, I would just do that. Um, because it's like the joy of the Champions League has kind of been sucked out because it's like, if we don't go through, we all know that like, it's going to be sack the manager, get rid of these players. The project has failed, blah, blah, blah. So there is nothing to really like look forward to in terms of like, unless we win, it's just like, I don't know. There's just like, the journey is just like not, be, it's not fun. Like, I don't know how to describe it to you guys. It's not fun. Like, it's just not because every, like it's already been set up as the failure of a lifetime if we don't go through. And I told you guys this from the very beginning that a lot of Arsenal fans have been very disingenuous about how easy it would be for this Arsenal team to compete in the Champions League. My expectation was to get to the quarterfinals and then whatever happened from there happens. And, you know, we're playing up against a Bayern side that has lost, you know, the Bundesliga title to Bayer Leverkusen. And so they're being viewed as this like really shit team. But as we saw in the first leg, they're not as shit as probably people thought. And now we're in Munich and we are, you know, we didn't look great against Villa. We looked like our legs were gone. We looked like we were going through that thing where nobody can run weirdly. And so it's just not going to be that easy. Both of the teams that people thought were not going to go through yesterday went through, like they went through like Everybody thought Barcelona and Atleti would go through and Dortmund and PSG went through. Like, it's just not that cut and dry. It's not that simple. And people got caught in this whole idea that we're good in the Premier League, so we're good in the Champions League. My expectations are that this, if we do go through, it'll it'll be because, like, it's a very tight game. We're not running up in, your, um, in, in Munich and just bopping them. That's not going to happen. But do we have the opportunity to go through? Absolutely. Like, we are a good side. And when we play... We're good. When we do what we do against Villa, we're diabolical. And so they have to dust off whatever that was against Villa. The players that sunk the ship are not, they're not playing in those positions. They're not there. So there should be no reason why this team does not perform to the best of its abilities. Right. And so 
this will be a good test for that because you guys know I didn't really buy into the lineup nonsense. I, I really didn't. I just think this team fundamentally in April has a result like Villa every year, no matter who plays in what position, no matter who's out there. And it's more of a mental thing than anything else. That is, that's how I feel. Um, and then the manager doesn't help it by being, you know, by panicking with his substitutions. So hopefully Mikel has looked at, you know, what happened in the Villa game and can recognize when players are tiring, when he needs to change things up, when the other manager has made a change that is making it difficult for us to do what we need to do. And also hopefully these players are ready to put their chances away. One of the main reasons why we did not beat Villa is because in the first half when we had chances, we did not put them away. And so we will get opportunities just like we did in the first leg against Byron. We had opportunities to go 2 0 up and we didn't take them. We didn't, you know. So this is it. This is the time to come up with the moments. And one thing that's been, you know, spoken about quite a bit over the last couple of days is, you know, um, do Arsenal have enough players? have the players to create special moments in, in cups. And I think it's a cup thing with Arsenal. I don't think it's, you know, just a champions league or Europe thing, because even in domestic cups, we stink, you know, <laughs> you know? So, and when you think back to like the last time we won a cup, we were the team and the way that we were playing in the league was significantly worse. We weren't as good. Our, the system wasn't as good. We weren't as well drilled. But we genuinely won the FA Cup because we stunk it up. And then the moments that needed to be taken advantage of were taken advantage of. Like Aubameyang in the semifinal, Aubameyang in the final, um, things like that. And so the moments are so important. We need to create them. And when they happen, you need to take them. And I'm not sure that this team has figured out that part of cups that you can't just play the way that you play in the league. You have to create moments and take them. The last couple of games that I've watched that don't have anything to do with the the Premier League sides, you know, the, the Dortmund Atletico game, you know, the PSG Barcelona, Barcelona game. That was just a bunch of fucking moments. Neither team system was doing this, was doing that. It wasn't nothing like that. It was just Players on the line, like there was so many moments where it's like, damn, if that had went in, what would have happened? You know, um, both teams kind of open, like what's going on here? And it was just Dembele taking the moment, just Vitinha taking the moment, just Sabitzer taking the moment, right? And so getting out of league system mode and getting into if we don't win, we're out mode. And so people need to rise out of what they would normally do and create those moments, even for themselves. That's where I feel like the gap has really not, we haven't really clocked that yet in the champions league. Um, and so the Porto, the Porto ties were hard and this one has been hard too. Um, where, you know, we know that we can go toe to toe with these teams. We know we can, we have the quality, but I'm still looking for those moments. Right. And so, um, it's up to the players to make it happen. You got to make it shake, you know, and Arteta needs to know when to make the changes. Players are tiring, make the right tactical changes, whatever he has to do. But ultimately, once those 11 players cross that line, they need to want to win more than they want to fucking breathe. That's it. Like they have to want to go to the next round more than anything else. And if they don't, they will go home, you know? So we've seen this before. Under Mikel in cups beyond the FA Cup that we won when we first when he first got here, we haven't been able to create those moments and we stink it up and go home. So change the narrative. It's all up to them. It's all up to them. And the players that people want out there on the pitch are out there. So there's no excuse why shit should not be shaken. Right. And so get it done. Get it done. Like. <laughs> Get it done. Um, Chosen One says, Just I've said it before, we have the creators of moments, Odegaard, Saka, Jorginho, et cetera, but maybe we don't necessarily have that killer to finish the magic yet, at least not almost every game like Mbappe. And, you know, when you think about the players, the, the people that we're talking about mostly at the end of games, massive games where they're like really sticking with us, we're mostly talking about defensive performances, whether it's Saliba, Rice, Gabriel, 
whatever, we're rarely talking about, oh my gosh, like Saka had this, this magical game where he just made it happen for the team. And that's not to sl like slag off Saka at all. Saka has done a lot for us this season. Let's be serious, you know? Um, but what I'm saying is that like, have we had a standout attacking performance from Odegaard, Saka, Martinelli, Jesus, any of these players this season? Probably not. Maybe Jesus against Sevilla, but like, I don't even know if that really counts as like, oh my gosh, like this player was unplayable on this day and they dragged us over the line and that's what it's going to take. Uh, you know, somebody has to have their Declan Rice versus Manchester United moment, Declan Rice versus Chelsea moment. You know, it's really come from those defensive players. They have had the bigger moments. The attacking players haven't had it as much. Um, you know, where they've gotten two goals and an assist and just absolutely just like smashed it, right? And so it's up to them, I feel like. You know, the defense, I feel like, will do their job. But sometimes the defense needs to be bailed out. And this season, they've been doing a lot. And I feel like, in the bigger matches, the the part of the, the group that has not stepped up has been the attackers. And so they're probably a couple of players short of that. You know, we've been speaking at nauseum about needing a striker, needing a winger to like really get that, you know, attack going. That being said, the players that we have absolutely have the ability to do those things. I feel. I think Martinelli has the ability to create a moment. Trossard does. Jesus does. But they have to lock in. They have to lock in. They just have to, you know? So, listen, it's up to them. It's up to them, you know? Um, Timothy says, man, man them. <laughs> Sounds so weird coming out of my mouth. Must stay in the stadium all 90 minutes. We must support our football club to the end. One love. I think, honestly, like, the away fans are always good. The home fans are stinky sometimes. And, like, it's it's tough because if you're not a match going fan, you often don't feel like you can speak to these things. Um, but I just feel like the the home fans were pathetic against Villa. I'll be really serious. Like, I'll be honest, like it wasn't loud. They left when we went to nil down with eight minutes to go. It was the first time that they have experienced any sort of real adversity in 2024 with this team in that stadium. And they fucking bottled it and so yeah the, the team wasn't playing good but you're gonna have fucking games like that they emptied the stadium and it looked fucking atrocious so I think the away fans are usually very loud and very supportive stay to the end whatever it's not the away fans there is something about this team and this this fan base in that Emirates stadium it's not good it's eerie like it just is you know and early on in the season when they were, you know, basically like anytime Raya touched the ball, they got quiet or the groans and stuff like that. I just feel like, how do you, like, can you not put your bullshit aside just for five seconds to make sure that like you're at least giving the best possible energy to a player that is literally between the sticks for your club? More than anything, you need that player to be confident. And every time he touches the ball, it's, oh my God, you know, and it's just like, okay, how is that going to help him? You know, and it's not just Raya. It's been several players this season. I've seen it with Havertz and it's also happened with Zinchenko. So at home, we're not great. Away from home, we're fucking brilliant. So I expect those fans, they're going to do what they need to do. Unless we get stomped out 6-0. I don't know, you know, but 2-0 down with eight minutes to go. Be fucking for real. Stay in. Um, Alex says, I can't believe this backlash against Arteta. It's just crazy people want him sacked. I could understand if we were mid-table. We're always a loss away from the Arteta out conversation online. I don't actually think it's the same in the stadium. I do feel like people are like, there is a little bit of like disappointment or like, here we go again. Like that's definitely there. But I feel like mostly it's just like the online fans, you know? Um, but I, like I've always said, I don't feel like a managerial conversation or speaking about the manager should be taboo, but I feel like, you know, are we really at that point right at the second? Probably not, but it doesn't really matter. Like when we were, when we beat Nottingham Forest in the first game of the season, there were already people that were lining up. Like we don't look the same. We're shit. Oh my God. Havertz. Oh my God. You know, so we're always like a second away from it. And some of it is because when you haven't won trophies, 
you always feel like the manager is like that that's that's what's going to solve this problem you got to get the manager out um but are we there like right at the second i don't think so but we're always there you know that that's just kind of what it is uh you know it was just always kind of there in the background it always has been you know um, so yeah, boy says Martinelli has, uh, picked up a chronic injury this season. That's why he's struggling to adapt to, by the look of it, we'll see what happens. And Martinelli is an interesting one coming into this game. Um, if you were fooled by Trossard doing the presser, this is probably the third time this season that he's put somebody in the presser that didn't end up starting. So I didn't really think much of it, but you know, Martinelli has had a stinky season, but I don't think it's like. Martinelli having a poor season doesn't mean Martinelli is a poor player. Um, and I feel like that's the problem is that whenever you have like start talking about Martinelli's season, people are hearing you think Martinelli shit. It's not that. Do I think he's as good as people always make him out to seem? No, I think he has like a, like a lot of things he can improve on, but he's only 22. So of course he's not perfect. Right. But the shift in the people that are around him, plus the chronic injury, like you've spoken about. And then also just like probably just himself, maybe, maybe he's lacking a little bit of confidence have all created a little cocktail of Martinelli having probably his worst season as an Arsenal player, besides the, the season where um, he didn't play because he was injured for the majority of it. So it's a tough one because you've lost a player. That's probably one of your best finishers, um, in a season where we struggled early on in the, in the season to score goals. So it's been tough. Like it really has, like they showed, um, a list of the top goal scorers in, you know, the top five goal scorers in the league. And there wasn't an Arsenal player in sight. And last season, I think we had like two in the top five or something like that, like Martinelli and Sack or something like that. Like, or Martinelli was definitely in there cause he had 15 goals. Um, and if he did had the same season he had last season, this season, um, he would have been in the top five right now. Right. And so, um, it's tough to lose a player like that, whether it's from injuries or whatever, because you need a consistent finisher in your squad. And maybe that's something that has been generally overlooked by Mikel and the, the, um, the recruitment team is that every other team has a reliable goal score in their team. Um, and maybe we don't have the overall quality to do, you know, what Klopp and Pep did for, for years with false nines. Um, you know, that collective group that could re like, you know, really like even cause really what it comes down with, with Arsenal is like, we, we score enough goals in the league, but when we get into fine margin situations, we don't score goals. So, you know, when we have those conversations about like, oh, well we need a striker and people are like, yeah, but we, we scored 80 goals last season. We don't need a striker. It's not about the quantity, it's when we score those goals. You know, are we getting them against Villa? Are we getting them away at Villa, away at Newcastle? Are we getting them away at City? Are we getting them away at Anfield? Like, things like that. And that's when we do need that striker, right? And so, I don't know if it's just been, like, overlooked or what, but losing Martinelli has really hurt us this season, I feel, because he does tend to come up with the bigger goals in the bigger situations. Like he scored away at Anfield, right? He's one of those guys. So losing him has been really tough. I'm hoping that he has a better game. I thought Kimmich got the better of him in the first leg. Um, Kimmich is a good like defender and he did a good job on him, but it's do or die, man. Yeah, it's do or die. Like, you know, it really is. You got to do it, you know? So um, it's really up to the team to go beyond whatever injury you have, whatever lack of confidence you have, whatever, whatever, and just create the fucking moment and take it. That's it. Um, but yeah, uh, targeting a must end says, come on, Havertz, you can score a hat trick. Come on, Jorginho, you can run faster. Come on, Tamiyasu, you can do it. Um, I mean, I don't know. Uh, just win. Just, just win. That's, that's really the, the remit. That, that really is whatever, whatever, whatever you need to do to win, do it. Like, that's it. Um, and you just kind of like, even if we go down a goal, I do feel like this iteration of Arsenal does not have the resilience to come back the way that last season's Arsenal did. And I don't really know why that is. We go ahead now. And once we go ahead, we do it. Most times um, we don't lose. 
But this team, when they go behind, it hasn't happened a lot. But when it happens, we don't get it done. Last year's Arsenal, it didn't matter what was fucking going on. We were coming back, you know, so they need to tap into 2022, 2023 Arsenal just a little bit. If we go down, please do not panic. Do not panic. It is not over. Look at what happened with PSG yesterday. You know, Dortmund went into that leg, like that final leg of that tie behind. So you don't have to just like collapse when you go down, you know, they probably will score a goal. That is the likelihood. They probably will score a goal, you know? So we may have to score two. You don't need to collapse, you know? Um, that's like the main thing for me. Um, do not collapse. Mentally, you are still in the game, even if, you know, we go down a goal, okay? Uh, Keto says, it's crazy to say after the Villa game, but Trossard is the best finisher in the team by a lot. I mean, Trossard not finishing that chance was ridiculous and he probably will look back at that and be like fuck I really should have put that in the back of the net and that was not the only chance that we had but that was probably like the most egregious one you know but he is still probably our best finisher and when he gets in the box he tends to be able to relax his mind and finish very simple chances uh and that's what you need um and that's the problem that you have with Trossi is that when he's closer to the sideline that's not really as bad. Like his main thing is to be in the box and put the ball in the back of the net. And, uh, you know, a lot of times our wingers exist on the halfway line, you know, um, they're not high and wide all the time. Even they're even more like sunk in to the rest of the team this season. So yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I feel like we have two left wingers that are probably more suited to play central and you see less of their powers, the further away they are from goal and that's tough but if you get both of them whether that's martinelli or or trossard in the box they're probably two of our most dangerous players right so you, you can't really get them both on the pitch today but yeah that's probably that's the situation that we're in and that's probably why arsenal need to really look at that position and say it's not so much that those players are not good it's are we getting the best out of them far away from the goal and if we can't get them closer to goal on a regular basis, then there needs to be somebody different in that space, you know, because left wing is a little bit of a, it's a little bit of like a graveyard shift right now. And that's not the way it should be. I don't think, um, but it, if it, if it is going to be a graveyard shift, then it needs to be somebody out there that's okay with being isolated that can be in the half space and create chances. And, you know, that's, that's something that they need to look at. That's not something that we can, you know, do now, because we're in the middle of a season or we're at the end of a season, but it's definitely something that needs to be looked at, I feel. Um, let's see. Uh, Chosen One says, I do really hope that Real beat City. Haha. -ha. I do too, but I'm more hoping than anything that we just go to the next round. Like, whatever happens from there is whatever happens, you know? Um, Basho says, I want... Oh, my light went out. Hold on. I was like, that looked weird. Hold on, let me get my... I'll get it later. It's fine. You guys can still see me. I'll have to get it after. But um, Basho says, I want that Adeyemi Ute. <laughs> um, yeah, he looks good. Hold on. I'm going to have to do it later. I don't have time for that. You guys can see me. It's fine. Um, let's see. J1 says, uh, Darren Walton, look at what Arteta has done for the club. You guys are talking to each other. Uh, Dylan Blue says, I think you need to score first tonight and play on Bayern's pressure from their poor season. Um, that's an interesting point. Um, let's see. Basho says, magical night. I feel like one of the things that I would be a little bit, like, not a little bit, probably a lot of bit disappointed about, like, is if <clears throat> we go through this Champions League round, get knocked out by Bayern, and we didn't have that magical European night, I don't think we've had it. I think we can all say that with confidence that we really haven't had that magical, you know, maybe I'm just talking shit. I don't know. But you know what I mean? Like that magical, like, oh, my gosh, they did it. Ah, you know, maybe Porto was that. But we, really, we made Porto a lot harder than it needed to be. And I'm happy that we got through. Um, Turn on, idiot. Yeah. 
All right. Um, had to make that had to make that work. But yeah, it would be this is the opportunity. Like you really you think about it two ways. This is could be one of the most devastating and deflating nights, or it could be one of the best since Mikel Arteta has come in. Um defeating Bayern at their place, going to the semifinals of the Champions League after seven years of being out. Um, you know, so there's a lot like it could swing so harsh in either direction. Um, so I'm hoping for a magical night, but I would be really disappointed if we got, you know, this far, which isn't that far, but we've got this far and we haven't had our, like our magical night, you know, um, didn't really have it at home against either. Uh, you could say Porto, but like, you know what I mean? You know, not the penalty shootout. You guys know what I fucking mean. Uh, Curtis says, Jess, all the Arsenal fans need to have positive energy and support the team always. Easier said than done. Um, I don't. It's just easier said than done. I think online culture, you know, and stuff like that has made it so people feel like their role is not to support. It's to be like this truth this truth sayer and you know i've always said that it's gonna be this negative thing and agendas start to become more important and things so i do i think i like sometimes i watch other people's like watch alongs or clips from their watch alongs or their shows or whatever and i just genuinely feel like it's really hard for them to speak about anything positive um and even when we score goals there's like this almost like forced like having to like oh my gosh, we scored. And I would hate to live as a fan like that. I'd rather almost be like, you know, because I can't be critical. And sometimes I'm like, fuck, like, is Arteta the guy? But genuinely, when we start to play, I don't care who it is. I don't give a shit if it's fucking Cedric. Score Cedric. And if Cedric scores, I'm like out of my seat. I do not care about whatever agenda I have going. But I think online culture has made it such that some fans just don't really feel like they feel like their job is to be this truth person and be harsh and critical. And even if that conflicts with them just being genuine supporters, like even like um, they found even a way to remix that into, well, by me not being positive at all, I'm actually being a better fan than the people being supportive. And that's just where we are right now. Like it, who cares? Like, you know, it just, I don't know. We, we need to win. Like, you know, and if we do win, it's one of the best days. Like, you know, and and that's all I really care about right now. Um, Boy says, it's the Premier League of confirmation bias. If the film doesn't match the narrative, then they aren't really happy about winning. Um, let's see. Uh, Tashima says, can't see a point of Arteta out. Liverpool can't get a manager through the door to replace Klopp. Anton Dunn says, unless it's in Kedia for you. Unless it's in The way I celebrated that hat trick... That he scored against that that hat trick that he scored against freaking Sheffield. I celebrated that like it was any other person. Now, after the fact, I was like, that don't change shit. He still needs to go. But like, I'm not gonna sit, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like him scoring a goal is taking us backwards. Like, or like it's not a good thing. Like, it is a good thing when Eddie scores. He just doesn't do it enough, you know. So there you go. But yeah, Eddie. Um, that for, by the way, that that hat trick was actually very good. When you actually look at it, like there was no penalties. Um, one banger from outside the box, another like really cool touch in the box, like and then one off of a corner. That was actually a really good hat trick. Um, and hopefully that hat trick helps us get forty million for him in the summer. Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you know, um, Timothy says big up to the arsenal, no room for negativity. One love to the players, one love to the manager. It's right or die thing. I really hope that the players are channeling not necessarily like this, like, oh my gosh, if we lose, like all this, like not that nervous, tight energy, but like that, I want to win no matter fucking what. And I'm going to do what I need to do to make that happen. And like a never say die type of thing. That's what I'm hoping that they channel. Like, I really don't want to see the nervous energy that we saw in the first leg. You know, I felt like in every leg so far, there's been a nervous energy that has kept us from being able to like really take advantage of the moment. And maybe the moment just feels too big for them. But like genuinely, you'll be like, 
they have to feel like it's not, they want it, you have to want it really bad, but not want it too badly. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a situation in your life where you want something so bad, you're almost paralyzed by the fear of that thing not coming to fruition. They have to stop just shy of that. You know, just shy of I'm so I want it so badly that I'm paralyzed and I'm afraid to make a mistake because I don't want it to go away. They need to be wanting it so bad, but like right before the paralyzation, because I feel like sometimes the moment just takes them into that where we can't just do our thing. And when Arsenal are confident, we're one of the best teams out there. But when we're not, we cannot pass the ball five yards. We cannot pass the ball five yards. And individually outside of the system, sometimes you just have to win your individual battle. You know, um, sometimes I feel like, you know, every once in a while, the system gets out systemed, you know, a, a, a manager figures out a way to stop us from doing the bet, like what we really want to do. But that doesn't mean that we can't find solutions and we can't win our individual battles. And that's really where, you know, those like Sané versus, you know, Tamiyasu is going to come into play. Kane versus, you know, Gabrielle and Saliba. That's where those things really come into play. Declan Rice against Goretzka and Limer, like they're going to have to play outside themselves sometimes and just win their individual battle, even if the system is not giving what it needs to give, if that makes sense. Like, I feel like sometimes when the system gets a little bit like somebody has clocked us, you know, they're like, oh, we figured out how to stop you. We also stop winning our individual battles. And as long as you do that, you're in the game. As soon as you start letting what happened with Kivior and Sané happen, as soon as you let what happen, you know, when we um, gave away the penalty, it's fucked. You know, so just win your individual battles and let's go. Also, I hope they figured out the when to do the switching with Declan and Jorginho. I feel like in the last couple of games when we have played with the two of them, it hasn't been as seamless as it was before. And maybe, it, again, it's just people figuring us out. But when it comes to like Jorginho, I don't necessarily, when they, when I guess it, it happens when they beat our press and Declan is a big part of our press because he's really good at winning the ball up high. But sometimes once they bypass him, what Jorginho just does is drop, 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 drop. And it creates like a confusion of when they're breaking on our back line where then we start to do nonsense, right? And so I'm really hoping that like we figured out a solution for that against Bayern. Because they have players that can drop into midfield, we're really lucky that like Gnabry and Alfonso Davies are not there, but they still have players that can kind of drop into that midfield space, help them beat the press. And when those players are just running at our back line, it's kind of like it's ominous, you know? So Jorginho and Declan really have to like figure that out. And I feel like in this game, I prefer Declan to be a little bit more of the six and Jorginho can pop into the advanced position and help us, you know, get those little threaded passes. I really don't want to see Jorginho backing up into our back line and Declan running behind Sané and them just running towards our goal. You know, um, we saw it a little bit against Brighton. We saw it a lot against Bayern in the first leg. So, yeah. Um, Yo-Yo says, imposter syndrome. Arteta admitted his doubts in the summer. The squad fully embodies the manager. It's time to come of age. Um yeah, I mean, we've spoken about this a lot. Like, there's just a like. It, this is why, like, I I don't really, and maybe maybe it's like, okay, well, when you put certain players in there, then the imposter imposter syndrome gets worse. But because in 2020, when you know we did the same thing before Gabriel Jesus and Zinchenko came into the team, um, and it was like other players there. I don't actually think that this whole collapse in April is about certain players. I think it's, I do think it comes a little bit from the manager. I do think it comes from the inability to relax into a moment of pressure. You know, like some people really thrive under pressure and they get excited about being in a situation where the stakes are so high. I feel like Arsenal get tight no matter who's there. And then if there's just even like a little bit of friction going behind you know, missing a couple of chances, an injury, we cannot rebound. We can't. And the first season when we were trying to get into top four, came back from international break and lost 3-0 to Crystal Palace. And that's very similar to 
the Villa game. Very similar to losing 3-0 against Brighton last season. It's very so like a lot of these games, these themes are very similar. Fulham away this season, like very similar themes of getting to the end of the season and tightening up and not being able to relax and arrive at a moment in like excitement, they get fucking nervous. And I do think that that comes from maybe the manager not being able to get them into a mindset of excitement. They they come into it like, oh my God, if we don't get it, it's going to be the end of the world or something. And as somebody that has panicked their way into fucking up a massive opportunity, I I can see it. Like, you want it so bad that you just can't relax and be excited to be in the moment. You know, they need to be in the moment. This is the third season where, of course, we're in a really good opportunity. Like things are on the line. We really cannot do the three losses in a row really tight when we get in front of the goal, making bonehead mistakes at the back. You know, we really can't have that, you know, and so. I do think that they need to, hopefully they've learned from past seasons, but Villa didn't fill me with that. Like it filled me with like, okay, so they have it again. You know, Bayern at home was the first chip at the armor. Then now this is the second Villa to chip at the armor. And now we're going away, which, you know, we went away to Newcastle, you know, in that first season and lost 2-0, pathetic, you know? So I feel like it's Arsenal in April more than anything else. We've seen this story before, but they have every opportunity today to change that narrative. There's nothing stopping them. They don't have injuries. We're nil-nil in the tie. We're playing against a Bayern team that we match up to quite well. There's nothing stopping us really from getting to the next round but ourselves. You know, we didn't take advantage of do doing it at home, but we were good enough to make sure that we didn't completely take ourselves out of it. So they need to arrive into this opportunity with excitement and not fear, you know? And sometimes I feel like we just, in April, we just start being so afraid of our own shadow. And I feel like that comes from the manager because again, I've had managers or like ma not managers, but coaches that have different styles before championships or before like, you know, big matches or whatever. And a, like a lot of your confidence in the way that you go into a game do does kind of come from a manager. It does. You know, if you played at any level, you know, if you had different types of coaches, some of them will have you sh about to shit yourself and some will have you excited to kick the ball, you know? So that's just kind of where I'm at. Um, Quasi says, Arsenal fans are no better. We do not inspire confidence in the team, freaking out at every mishap. I, I do think that, like, one of the, the things that is kind of disappointing, too, is that, you know, like, Trossard was like, there's a lot of talk after one loss. And they're very, they're obviously very clued in on what's going on on socials. And even, like, the stuff with uh, Garnacho will show you that. Not even an Arsenal player, but you know that they're looking, they're watching channels, not my channel probably, but if you guys are watching the channel, I love you guys, please win. But they are watching these YouTube channels. They are on Twitter. They are seeing what's going on. And that could be, that's, that's probably not the best, you know, but it's just the reality. You know, they have their phones just like we do. And so they're very clued in on how the fans feel. And over the last couple of days, they've probably mostly seen fans acting like they're the worst fucking team on the planet because they lost to Aston Villa and throwing the season away again. You know, so we do have some culpability in this. The club is also the fans as well. Is it the main culpability? No. Obviously, the manager and the players carry the most, but the fans do play a part and we don't play our part very well, especially not at the Emirates. <laughs> uh, Clement has the bench here. Um, Hein, Ramsdale, Zinchenko, Kivior, Parte, El Nenny, Vieira, Smith Rowe, Nelson, Trossard, Jesus, and Enkedia. I know some people wanted Parte to start. Let's be serious for five seconds. He has not played very much. And so I think it's the right call to do Jorginho. Um, that being said, Maybe Parte can come on for the last couple of minutes if we still are needing something a little bit different, whatever. Maybe Jorginho tires. Um, you know, Smith Rowe and Vieira right now are such 
wild cards in the bench, which is something else that, you know, I've been talking to people on like different, like, you know, chats and stuff about is that the lack of confidence that I have in those two players to actually have a ma major impact in a, in a situation where we probably will need them or could potentially need them is, is kind of, you know, disappointing because, um, you know, sometimes you need a goal. Sometimes you need a bit of creativity, a little bit of something different, but not only do I not think that Arteta would have the confidence to put them in, um, but I also don't feel like if they were about to, they were warming up on the sideline that I would feel confident that they'd make a difference. And that's something to think about, you know, is the bench really as deep as we think it is? You know, I think Trossard is probably our most reliable and obviously like Jesus has quality, right? From an attacking standpoint, but there's some dead space in there. You know, there's some real dead space in there, some real question marks in there. Um, I feel like if Zinchenko was warming up, a lot of people would be about to like jump off of a cliff. Kivior has, he, I feel like he's a good player and he's done well, but he also has shaky moments in big games. Partey, we're not sure about his fitness. Don't trust Elneny. Don't trust Fiera. Probably don't trust Smith Rowe that much either. Nelson and Enkedia. So really what we're looking at is Jesus and Trossard and you know, then they got a lot of question marks in there, you know, so is the bench really as deep as we think it is? I don't know. Has Arteta really answered that question about whether or not he can keep the bench on like ignited and like in like in integrated with the rest of the team and get a lot of joy from the bench? I don't know. Um, because it's just another lost season for Smith Rowe and Vieira really. You know, and those are two players that in, in different ways, one, we invested a lot of money in and another has had a lot of investment in time. And I feel like they've both had lost seasons, both. Um, and right now, a lot of your special moments come from attacking players. And it's like, you know, if something were to happen to Odegaard or you wanted to go a little bit more attacking in midfield, would you really trust either one of them to come in? Probably not. You know, we've also had to move to this double six formation and move Declan Rice into the eight, probably because Emil Smith Rowe and Vieira are not trusted. It's tough, you know. So is that bench really as deep as we think it is? Maybe not, you know, but that's just how that, you know, that's all like that's definitely something that like I'm thinking about. Um, just to keep you guys updated, there's 222 of you guys in here, which is fucking amazing. Make sure you guys are liking the video, subscribing to the channel. And I also would like to invite you to copy and paste that link or touch that link, whatever you have to do in order to get to that website. Um, it's pinned in the, in the, um, it's pinned in the comments, the chat It's pinned in the chat. And it's also in the description box. That's how you're going to get to the watch along that I'm going to do in just about 10 minutes. We're going to head over there. So if you guys want to continue this party and watch this game together, um, you guys can do that with me by copy and pasting or clicking on that link and using code Jessica to sign up. Um, and we'll be there. You know, we will be there. And um, the watch alongs have made it a little bit easier to watch the games because I don't feel alone in being so nervous, you know. So there you go. Um, I'm actually going to just make this into the ticker here there you go just to remind you guys so um Burmese says we lack the squad depth until we have two strong teams starting bench will likely never challenge city for for a title i feel like well we're not completely out of the title race i know a lot of people have said like it's over and it, it doesn't feel great you know right now but we're with the team that we have, we are challenging city for a title and have done so for two years now, you know? So I don't know if it's two 11s. I feel like sometimes we're like, well, we have to have two 11s with the, I don't think it's necessarily that because city also don't have two 11s. That is a really like misconception. They have a very strong, like 15, 16, maybe 17. It's not two 11s, but what they have is a lot of quality in the five players that they can trust off of the bench where we have, you know, eight players that we can bring off of the bench, but probably only one or two of them we really kind of trust um, and genuinely could start for multiple games in a row in this Arsenal team without any drop off. 
And so I don't actually think it's two 11s. I actually think we need to condense Jorginho and Partey, get rid of one, bring in another midfielder and condense Fabio Vieira and Emil into one player and two midfielders that are of true quality would be so much more beneficial to this quad than four players that have so much questions around them, whether that's being able to stay fit or quality or like, do they fit the system? Do, you know, things like that. So I think what we have is not enough. We have a lot of quantity, but not enough quality. And we don't need two 11s. We need like four or five players off the bench that we can like really rely upon that. And it's not just reliable. Like they need to have genuine quality, genuine quality. Um, and right now it doesn't look like we have that, you know, it doesn't. Um, so yeah, Orpheus says nothing would make me happier than Kai winning us this game. Kai going back up to the nine, um, you know, back to where he's played his best football for our snow. Hopefully it will help us. Um, you know, I think everybody needs to have a massive game that Kai Havertz has. When he has a good game for us, we usually play really well. And so we're going to need him to to do his thing. You know, um, he has to come up with that big goal for us, you know, and hopefully he does. Um, you know, um, let's see. Uh, I'm just looking at the comments, making sure I'm not getting the, the same people over and over. Die Hard Gunner says Jorginho is this year's Rob Holding. Yo-Yo says, your expectations of the bench have been colored by Arteta and Edu. These questions can only be answered by them. I mean, because, but I always say that I don't actually know if these players are just not good enough or if Arteta has not used them in a way to get the best out of them. And I will always feel that way because for some of these players, they've only gotten like 90 minutes here you know, 30 minutes there, you know, in positions that aren't naturally the positions that they would normally play. Like, let's call a spade a spade. Emil is a 10. Vieira is a 10. The two of those players operate best in the pockets in and around the box. Emil Smith-Rowe arrives in the box, scores goals. He can overlap. He's a good, like, wing forward type 10. And, um, and Fabio Vieira is best with the final ball. And the person that's best with the final ball usually exists in the pockets in and around the box. The two of them, when they play in midfield, operate in the eight role. And I don't think that that suits their natural skill sets. I think we're forcing them in ways that don't suit them that well, you know, um, just like the whole, you know, thing with Kai, you know, and also now Rice is playing a position that's not his best. We've put Rice, Kai, Emil, Vieira, Trossard, all in this left eight position. And none of them really suit it that well. And what that says to me is that I don't feel like we are modifying to suit the players that we have, but also that we haven't bought the player that we just needed to get. And it's just obvious that we needed to buy a left center mid. It always was obvious. So um, either switch it up so that, you know, they could do the best that they can, meaning let them play in the number 10. Um or move them on, you know, and buy somebody that can play in that position. Um, but I don't actually believe that Emil Smith Rowe and Vieira are just so shit. You know, I don't believe that. I, I don't like my gut tells me that they just are having a hard time adapting to a system that doesn't suit their strengths. And they also have issues staying fit, you know, and, and those those are on them, you know. So there's that. But you know, if if Arteta were to get you know, better players on that bench. Would he be able to use it better? I don't know. Cause no matter who's on that bench, we don't get a lot from it, you know? So I don't know. I don't know. Does he need world-class players on the bench? Maybe he does, you know, but not a lot of teams have world-class players just chilling on their bench. <laughs> I don't know you, you know, JK um, says Palacios at Leverkusen go for in the summer. Um, bro pro says Musiala versus e uh, ESR, but Arteta does not like fun. Fair enough. <laughs> he doesn't like fun. Um, yeah. Uh, Basho says that eight role was made for Joe Willick. I um, missed that guy. Um, I mean, unless you wanted another injury prone player, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but he's been injured like a lot for, for Newcastle. So I say I'm, we did a good job selling him for the 25 million that 
you know, we, we, we sold him for. Um, the problem is, is that this past summer when we had so much money, we had like the world at our feet. We were the best young project in the league. We could have bought pretty much any left center mid that you can think of barring Barella and maybe like a Frankie de Jong or whatever. And we went out there and didn't do it, you know, and we sold Jacka. So I don't think it's like Willick is such like a redundant, you know, he's not fit for Newcastle and rarely plays for them. So we sold him. And I think that that's a good sale. Somebody that cannot stay fit that we sold for 25 million. That's a great sale, but we haven't addressed midfield like, and it's been an ever present conversation since Mikel has been manager. And it's the one position that I feel like besides striker that he's kind of just like almost like trying not to address. And I don't know why, you know, cause it's so obvious that striker and left center mid need to be um, in uh, the goat. Arsh says I thoughts on Coleman and Davies um, and Gnabry, uh, Gnabry not playing. Um, I don't think it changes much, you know, because where they had their stronger 11 at home or at our place, uh, now they have a, maybe a weaker 11, but they're at their place. So I don't think it changes as much as people think. Um, their lineup has two left uh, left backs on the left side, I feel. Um, I'll actually just look that up really quick just to make sure. But I don't actually think this changes very much. Um I think that they're going to feel good about going through at their place. And when you're playing at home, you tend to be able to get away with not having your best 11 sometimes. And so I don't actually think that changes very much, you know, but that's just me. Um, what it does change a little bit is that you have, you know, the Guerrero, like Guerrero, Mizrawi types. Let me just make sure I'm looking at the right lineup. Yeah, so you have Guerrero and Mejrawi on that left-hand side. So now instead of having two kind of like more explosive ball carriers in the team, they have more ball-to-feet guys. And so that's a different conversation altogether. You know, how do we exploit that? But they're two good technicians that aren't necessarily that fast, but they'll probably double up on Saka on that side to stop him from doing any anything and in years gone, like we know that the formula is stop our right hand side, stop Arsenal. Tuchel said it in his his press conference, and what he's what he has there speaks to like okay, we're trying to stop that side. As long as we stop that side, we stop Arsenal. And so, um, it's a big big day for the left hand side to show up. You know, um, Martinelli and and um. Rice, when they get up there, have got to make the most out of what they have. And the problem that you have is I still feel like even though Rice is probably our best number eight, which is a whole nother conversation in itself, he doesn't necessarily have the cuteness with his passing to get Martinelli into those those zones. And so it's kind of still a little bit of a clunky left-hand sign. But that being said, like like I, like I said before, the Champions League transcends, you know, it, it neutralizes all this bullshit about systems and connectivity and all this kind of stuff. Individuals have to win their individual battles. And that is 90% of it. So even if Rice and Martinelli are clunky as fuck, they need to figure out a way to be better than Kimmich, Dyer, and Limer. That's what they need to figure out by by any means necessary right and so i think that you know obviously and they put those two left backs on that side um and so they won't be as expansive or able to run past us like they were in the first game but what they will try to do is lock down our side now something else that we probably don't have to be as worried about maybe is ben white not being able to overlap as much because you know the threat in behind is not as bad, but I do imagine that Musiala will float. And so maybe he'll pinch off to that left-hand side. So that's how I kind of envision things going, but win your individual battles, guys, win your individual battles. If Martinelli and Martinelli and Rice, Rice not being, you know, a uh, Xhaka, you know, type Martin, like make it work, make it work. You know, um, Tashima says score prediction. 
I'm not even going to give a score prediction. I'm just going to say my prediction is that Arsenal go through. And that's what I'm going to hope. Um, Because whether it's by 1-0, 2-0, penalties, whatever, I don't care. We need to go through. And so that's probably what I'm going to go with. Um, I guess my hot take would be I feel like if we do go through, it'll be through penalties, you know, um, and somehow them bottling it. You know, so that's kind of what I'm thinking. But that's just me. This is going to be a tough, tough game. Um, but Arsenal, it's in it's in your power to make it happen. You know, so there you go. Guys, we're going to go ahead and end the stream. Like I was saying, link is pinned in the chat for you guys um, to join the watch along. All you have to do is use code Jessica, J-E-S-S-I-C-A. And um, you guys can can join from there. I will also just get the link one more time and put it in the chat so that you guys can um can um can join the watch along but I'll look forward to seeing you guys there um and then after that we'll do player ratings and hopefully we're rating a fucking win and going through to the to the other side but um yeah I'm super excited to um to do the watch along with you guys and I really thank a lot of you guys for for coming to the pre-match vibes um, I really appreciate that. Like and subscribe on your way out and I will see you guys on the watch along. Bye guys.